63, aka Dean Millet, is a prominent Australian YouTube gamer and Twitch live streamer. Having started his channel a decade ago, Twisty's channel gained popularity initially through videos on Big Ant's game AFL Live in 2011. Since then, he's established himself in both the AFL and cricket gaming niches through extremely consistent and well-produced content, which has allowed him to amass more than 55,000 subscribers on YouTube. In True Footy Podcast 51, Dean and I discuss where it all began for him, his love for the Richmond Tigers, and even some insight into his involvement with Wicked Witch's AFL Evolution 2. I hope you enjoy the episode. All right, g'day guys. Welcome back to True Footy Podcast 51. We are absolutely on a roll with guests at the moment. And today I am joined by a YouTube streaming extraordinaire, uh, Twisty3, the uh, Richmond Tragic. Thank you for joining me today, Dean. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. It's uh, obviously a bit, bit disappointing there's no footy, but um, happy to be here. Yeah, absolutely, mate. I can imagine this is um, a pretty busy time for you as well as a content creator. Have you sort of been keeping your head down and, and making lots of content? Yeah, it's uh, it's sort of a weird one because I've almost found myself working harder, the fact that more people are at home. So I'm like, ah, oh, I, I know people want to see things because they want to keep themselves entertained. So just doing my best to get as much out as I can. Yeah, that's it, man. I, I can relate to that as well. I'm on self-isolation, so I'm um, taking this opportunity to do podcasts with people such as yourself. So I appreciate you taking the time, mate, especially with AFL Evolution 2 on the horizon. Um, I'd imagine there's a lot of content to come out about that. But first of all, the first question, mate, um, I want to ask you is, there's a good chance people who watch this are well aware who you are, but uh, why don't you go ahead and tell us uh, what your channel is for someone who might not have heard of you? Um, so I basically focus a lot on like sports video games, mostly Aussie rules and cricket, um, being the two major sports that I sort of cover. Um, it's sort of something that when I first started doing it was like, Hey, this is different. No one was doing it at the time. Um, still very few people are, but, um, I think I found something that I really enjoyed and I was able to like create something that I thought was unique and different to what other people were doing on the platform. And, um, just make some really enjoyable videos. So, yeah, Mo- mostly focused on games. Like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Um, so, how long, uh, how long ago was it that you actually started doing it, and what was the rationale? Was it did you sort of have the intention of I'm going to make a YouTube channel, or was it just you kind of put up a couple of videos as a laugh? What was the actual thinking behind it? Um, well, my first video was uploaded in 2010, so that was a long time ago. Um, and I, it was like a call of duty video where just me and my friends were just like hacking on it. Um, and I think it was like, I just like saw other videos on YouTube and I was like, I can just get like a million views like that. That'll be easy. Like everyone's getting a million views. Cause I didn't realize like they're only showing you the videos that are popular at the time. So I was just like, oh yeah, that'll be super easy. I'll just make a lot of content. Um, sing star microphone camera on, stacked on books in front of the TV was the way to record things at the beginning. So I've come a long way. But uh, yeah, it was kind of just like to get into like whatever's going on. Just enjoy it, yeah. That's cool, mate. We I just sort of uh, vaguely remember that so, like at least my perception was that early on for you it was uh, around at the time of AFL Live with uh, the Big Ant game. Um, was that uh, you, you made a lot of content about that, a lot of helpful stuff. Was that fairly on in the early on in the piece? Yeah, um, I always had intentions of making videos for it because I'd played AFL like 2007, like for, you know, there hadn't been a game for five years or something. It was so long. So um, I definitely wanted to like play that game. I think I had like barely 100 subscribers at the time, uh, maybe even like 20 subs or something at the time. And I, I thought I'm pretty good at this game. I may as well make videos about it. So that's sort of how I started on there. And then it just sort of eventually got bigger. Yeah, well, you can say that because uh, now, nowadays you're actually sitting at over 55 and a half thousand subscribers, uh, which is an amazing effort. How, I mean, how is it, how, how would you say your goals have shifted? Um, it's probably a silly question. How have they shifted over time? Like what, at what point did it start becoming a real thing for you where you were like, I might actually be able to do this, you know, as more than just a passion, um, maybe even as a career? What, what point did that happen for you? Um, probably earlier than it should have. Um, I reckon 
Like, I think yeah, when I was in year 12 in high school, I was at like 1,000 subs. And I was like, oh, yeah, my my thing was always if I could get to 40,000, I was like, that's probably the tipping point of being able to do it properly, I reckon. I was like, all right, if I get to 40K, that's when I'm like, I was looking at all, I was doing all the math for everything. I was like, if I just get there. Um, and then after uni finished um, was sort of when I started uploading a lot more. And then I just saw the, the growth really go up and up. And it's sort of really been a slow burn. I guess like most of the channels you see on YouTube, you know, they grow very quickly to get to where they are. But me is sort of, because it is such a niche thing, it's taken ages to get to where I have. And I've kind of been okay with that because I know that like, as I keep growing, the ceiling for that type of content keeps growing because no one else is bigger than me doing that. So um, yeah, my mindset sort of just, always been if I can keep enjoying what I'm doing and pumping out stuff like that then that's the way to go about it yeah that's true I've, I've kind of made that observation as well I think like I don't know a whole heap about um, gaming um, as a sort of like niche but it seemed like some people was um, was sort of giving the advice you know gaming is a bit late to get into now but I feel like your niche with this, particularly AFL games and cricket you've kind of got like your niche of its own like the, um, the amount of effort you appear to go to to produce your content is unreal, man. Like I, 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 like I said, I don't watch too many gaming videos, but I'll happily just waste like an hour just watching <laughs> your, you know, your, your day four of your Ashes test or something like that, which is, which is really cool. Um, considering you have that, well, you appear to put that much time and effort into it. Do you do this full time or do you work around the site? I just have to ask that. Um, so as of maybe like three weeks ago, I'm doing it full time, but over the past, like, I've probably been doing it full time for like a year, right? Um, yeah. But I've basically been doing it, um, like, I've always had like sort of something on the side, if that makes sense. Like, either I yeah. was at uni or like when I finished uni, um, I think I had six months where I was like doing it full time. And then um, I started working on the AFL game. And then I did that for like, you know, two and a half years or something. And then I finished there. And then it was like, now I'm back to doing it full time for the next like six to eight months till something else comes along. Um, and then earlier this year, I was doing like a casual job for Fox FM for like a, a month or so. And now I'm back to doing it full time again. And hopefully this is the last time I have to do something else. So I can just keep doing this because I spent 15 hours editing today and like a massive long test match. And I was like, I'm so glad I was done with that. <laughs> lots of effort, but hopefully lots of reward. That's awesome. What, uh, can I ask what you did at uni? Uh, so I studied, um, you know, like I originally went to uni to study IT, uh, doing network stuff. And about a year in, I thought this is really terrible. And I should not be doing this. So I changed uh, and did a diploma of screen and media focusing on broadcasting and broadcast journalism. Um, so I did a lot of radio stuff there. Um, I think Caden was, he I don't know, he did something with someone in my uni class somewhere. to Like she trained him in radio. So I don't know, something to do with that. And that's how we initially met. Um, so, yeah, like it just screen and media was the what really did it for me is like I was like okay this is really what I want to do so yeah. okay that's cool so you still sort of harbor hopes of maybe uh, like pivoting and doing that sort of stuff in addition to YouTube or have you where, where's your goal at right now um, in terms of the short to medium term um well I really love what I've been doing on the platform like YouTube, YouTube's like one thing and then um, I really want to do more Twitch stuff which is you know a bit more variety in the games that I play as well um because it's just a whole different medium of creating content um something i found is i can do like i can stream something on twitch and it's like one type of content there and then if i cut it into a video it, it has to have a completely different narrative for youtube because otherwise people aren't they're like they consume content differently um mm. for me i probably the only thing i would like want to do uh would be like a commentator but because uh, i do that a lot in my videos and people are like, oh, you're really good at it. And I'm like, initially I was like, oh, like I didn't really give it much thought. And then I was like, actually, like I'm pretty good at this. Like, give me, give me a job. <laughs> like, that'd be great. <laughs> Just join me in the deep end. Fox footy, take me. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. You mentioned, um, you mentioned sort of meeting Caden. Do you, do you find that you've been able to meet a lot of people in doing similar sort of stuff? I was saying to Caden, um, 
like I'm in Perth and a little bit more isolated from sort of other AFL YouTubers and there are a few, but I just haven't met them yet. Um, is that, uh, has there been plenty of opportunity for you to sort of mix with like-minded people? Yeah. Um, especially in gaming, I think the gaming community in Australia is very tight. Like Twitch, um, like there's this big gaming event in Melbourne called PAX that happens every like October, November, sort of around then. And you know, that's when all of the main content creators come together for, you know, this event, um, to they'll all be around to do whatever. And even like at the AO Fortnite tournaments, you know, there's plenty of creators there. So you, you always get an opportunity to build relationships with different people. And for me, like I go into that, I'm not necessarily looking for someone to collaborate with. It's like, if I can find like a good person I like get along with, then if we collaborate, like fantastic, but like I'm there for the friendship because they're all super cool people. So like, it's just, yeah, they're all really good. That's good to hear. Would you describe yourself as kind of like more introverted or extroverted? And, and how would like, has, how has having a YouTube channel sort of developed that? Have, have you changed it all? Um, what would you say? Oh, I've definitely been introverted my whole life. Super shy, love the awkwardness. Um, I've definitely gotten better at like speaking about things. Um, I've always been, yeah, always been super quiet. Like want to avoid people at all costs unless I like know the person really well. Um, but I've been able to sort of grow and build different opportunities and things. Like this year, like I work at the Australian Open every year. This year was the first time I was um, one of like our team leaders. So, you know, we're responsible now for 60 people asking for help. There's like six people. So, um, that was something different that I really enjoyed, you know, being in that position. So I was like, oh, like I can actually do things rather than just hiding in my shell the whole time, which is good. That's good. I've noticed that's kind of a common trend amongst YouTubers, um, including myself. Like I, I consider myself introverted but with good social skills and from talking to you for like 10 minutes that may be a good way to describe you as well what do you think it is about you say you don't necessarily like being around people but you're you're talking to well when you've got a subscriber base of fifty five thousand people what why is it easier for you to talk to the camera is it just like a mental thing you're just not really thinking about um you know that element of it why is it easy for you or why does it appear easy yeah you can't see the people like I could be yeah. doing a live stream and there you can there could be a thousand people there watching and I all I see is my camera lens. I'm used to talking to it every day. <laughs> like there's nothing intimidating about that, you know. Um, even when I like it's surprisingly different because on when we were doing radio for uni, I was like I always wanted to see the numbers because I was like oh I want to see like how many people there are. But like and that would kind of intimidate me a little bit cause, like not knowing how many people were there. But yeah, with YouTube, but like, I don't know, it, like this is, this is my, like, I'm in my bedroom right now. This is where I record. Like, this is my safe space. Like, it doesn't feel like I'm being intruded on by a billion people. Um, yeah. Because it, you know, I, it's just, I'm just talking to me. Like, I'm just doing something I'm enjoying. Yeah, yeah that's, that's cool. cool. For, For me, me, I've, uh, I, I noticed that. that- yeah, obviously at first there's a little bit of awkwardness. I learned to talk in front of the camera. But for me, there was a huge jump up when I started doing live stuff. I don't know if you felt the same, but I even once, when I first live streamed, that was nerve wracking. But also I went on a like a little local radio thing. They wanted to talk about my channel and I was absolutely shitting bricks. And they were like, you do a podcast. Like why, why are you so nervous about doing anything broadcasting? But I, I don't know. It's just the the unpredictability of it being live you can't edit it out yeah. um do you are you nervous i mean you wouldn't be nervous anymore doing live streams but was that like awkward at first for you yeah because it's it's a bit different like it's obviously different um doing a live stream is is again like you have to perform differently to youtube mm. a lot of people who i i see a lot of youtubers who try and do live streams but they can't do it very well because either they like they'll bring too much intensity early and then they'll just like fade out or um, (laughs) there'll be like a lot of sort of dead air, you know, for, for some of those streams, something, you know, you, for what I like to do, I always like to have something happening, whether it's me talking or there's like a, something that I'm doing that's interesting on a game or if like, so if I'm really focused, you know, you need to show your focus. You can't just be there not doing anything. Um, or if my friends are talking like that's a bit easier to bounce off other people, or if you're talking to chat like this, 
yeah, it's still pretty nervous sometimes because, you know, there's something could go wrong and you're like, well, shit. But if it yeah. does, if it's fine, like you, you just trust yourself to not do anything dumb. I think essentially. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's true. true. No, Fair it's enough. not hard. Yeah, that's good. The one thing I don't think people realize, and I don't know if you can relate to this, but um, live streaming is exhausting, especially like you say, when you want to avoid dead air. I've done uh, live streams uh, by myself. Where I'm, uh, we did one where we were watching the AFL draft when it was just me. And I had to talk for five hours straight. And at the end of it, I was like, I cannot believe I did that because you can't like you can't pause while the other person speaks. It's just you who's got to fill the space. It's ridiculous. But one more question on um, on YouTube. I kind of um, one thing I also wanted to know is how do your friends and family perceive what you do in your channel? Is, is it something like for me, for instance, I find myself um, for instance, I don't I actually like, don't like talking about it too much with people because I don't feel like they'd understand. Um, but in terms of your friends and family, are they supportive? And is it something that, um, you know, you, you talk about with a lot of people or is it something you sort of keep to yourself? Uh, no, I definitely talk to a lot of people about it. Like, um, yeah, like my family's pretty good about it. They obviously want to see it do better. So they're like, then you can pay for everything. <laughs> so <laughs> that would be great. Um, like my friends are super supportive as well. Um, like one of my friends who is like always on my stream, like he's always, you know, telling me like, oh, I think like maybe you could do this, you could try this. And then I've got my other friends who are like good, but they're like, you should be playing better games. And I'm like, but the better games don't do as well, okay? So yeah. Let me do what I'm doing. So <laughs> that's pretty much the the brunt of it. Um, but yeah, they're all like, some of them don't really care. Some of them care. I think at the end of the day, I'm pretty happy. So <laughs> it's all about it. That's good, mate. What would you say is your the best thing about being a, a YouTuber, uh, as it were, if you had to nail one thing? Sorry, I've really put you on the spot there. Yeah, no, I think it's probably the other, like other people. I know it sounds stupid, but um, not necessarily fans because, like, obviously they're making your job or whatever, but um just the other people that i've been able to meet in the space like the gaming space has been so good like i've got you know lifelong friends from from that and you know for someone who's introverted uh being able to connect with other people by something as bizarre as making videos online um has been great so i've been able to just really enjoy getting to know different people and i actually look forward to it sometimes now i'm like oh yeah, like yes i want to go there so i can find someone new and just like be great yeah other people yeah 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 nice one i like that answer um in terms of youtube i also wanted to ask i've noticed you got involved a little bit with the afl in fact specifically i'm talking about the grand final video that you went to the game with uh, austin cookson um and you guys did a vlog how did that opportunity come about and what was that like um so i think a week before the grand final Caden sent me a message saying he didn't want to go. Do you want oh, to okay. do it? <laughs> and I was like, no, was my first <laughs> answer because I already had a ticket to the grand final. Like my membership already has me a ticket to the grand final. I was like, I don't want to have to stress. I don't want to have to yeah. worry about anything. I don't want to do anything. So I said, initially I said no. Um, and then I rang Cookson and he was so good on the phone and he was like, dude, don't worry about anything. I will take care of everything. Um, and in the other part of my head was my sister really wanted to go to the grand final cause she missed 2017 and she, uh, she didn't go and she doesn't have a membership that will get her a ticket. So I was like, all right, if I do this AFL thing, she gets to go to the grand final, even though my experience might be slightly dampened by the fact that I'm not sitting with the people I normally would be, I'll cop that. And we won by a lot anyway, so it was pretty good. Yeah, oh, you're a good brother. Um, how was the actual vlog experience? Though? Did you find it distracting at all? Ah, uh, like we we did a lot of stuff pre-game, and then I formatted the SD card fantastically, so we had to do it all again. Um, oh no! So, <laughs> so that that was really fun. Um, but yeah, like I didn't have to worry about too much. Austin was fantastic. He did he did so much stuff. Um, like he was good at talking to other people if he was going to film stuff of them. And even before the game, like he was like, you can just sit here and like get your head in the game and I'll go and film everything. So he did a lot of stuff. Like the AFL use a lot of their own footage as well. 
um, in that video, which was, you know, made the video better. But yeah, I didn't have to worry about doing anything. So um, it was really good for, for him to just do it all. And he was really good at doing that. Yeah. Just had to yeah, enjoy, that's... enjoy the moment was all I had to do, which was the main thing. That's good, mate. I want to ask you a little bit more about Richmond and the Premiership a little bit later on. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you is you mentioned it earlier. You did a little bit of work on the AFL game. You're referring to AFL Evolution 2? Correct. Uh, yeah, and cool. the first one as well. Cool. Uh, what exactly did that entail? What was your involvement? Um, so the first game, I did some testing really late in the piece. And pretty much the only main thing I did was like the trailer for the first one. Um because it was like really late in development, so there wasn't a heap that could have been changed. And then they said, hey, do you want to come back and do the next one? Um, we'll give you a bigger role this time. I was like, yep, sure. Sounds great. Because um, you know, I'm super passionate about it. I was like, I really want to make this game really good. So I came in. First thing they said was, hey, Dennis Committee is no longer commentating. Anthony Hudson is the new commentator. Uh, there was like three choices for the color commentator. And I was like, I want Gary Lyon. And I was like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rewrite everything. So I, I redid the whole script for the game. There was like, I don't know, 10,000 lines or whatever that I changed pretty much all of them to suit Hutto's commentary style. I watched like four or five games of football and wrote down every single word that was said and then like categorized everything. Like it was a shitload of work. It took me three months to do the whole script. Um, and then we spent another like, two months of recording sessions with Hutto. Like he was an absolute trooper. They were long grueling sessions and he was so good. Um, like he would sometimes lose it, lose it a little bit in the, the box. Cause he was just like over it, but he was so good. Um, and his performance is fantastic as well. So mostly the commentary was like the main thing. And then the other part of it was like, once that was out of the way, it was like, all right, let's really get stuck into how this game's going to work and play. So um, spent a lot of time looking at like behind the goals vision with some of the programmers because they m might not have seen the sport as much. Um, and then it was really just like articulating how the game should be played. So the whole thing's been like stripped back and we worked on a lot of it. Um, we had people from the AFL come in and be super helpful as well. So it's like a whole new thing, but it was so good for me to be able to go like this needs to change and then it would be able to get changed because I'm wow. like, this is something that I actually wanted to be really good. And when the game comes out, possibly on Friday, um, hopefully everyone else can see how much we've actually put in and done on this game. That's awesome, mate. You're kind of partially sort of living a childhood dream for me. I remember myself and I'm sure there are other young Aussie rules fans when they were younger. I really wanted to be involved in making an amazing AFL game. Um, I had no idea that the commentary took quite so long. I guess I would have guessed, you know, that it would be a little bit brutal, but did you say 10,000 or did I just play? So there's, I think there's 10,000 lines, like individual wow. lines. I know we spent 40 hours in the booth, um, just with Hutto. Gary was a bit easier cause, um, I rewrote how that whole thing worked as well. So it made more sense to someone like, cause I think it, pro like it had probably previously been written by like a programmer who just been yeah. like. Uh, like they just had all the categories and stuff, but they hadn't necessarily worked out how it would all flow. Sure. So I just like stripped everything back because as someone who commentates as well, yeah. I like knew what I was doing. And I was like, all right, when he says this, this guy should also come in and say this because that wow. makes sense. So it's not perfect, but it's much better than it ever has been. So, Oh, that's good. That's reassuring. I mean, at the end of the day for an AFL game, I don't think people really need to get uptight about the commentary. You know what I mean? Like, I, as long as it's a good football game. Um, like I said, like, this has been a bit of a childhood... Well, that is kind of a childhood dream for me. What's it been like for you to being on that? Was it kind of um, almost a dream come true or is that putting it a bit too thick? I mean, it's just, like, work at the end of the day. Yeah, um, okay. So, like, obviously, yeah, like, super cool experience to be able to be involved. I'm... I'm more keen to see when it comes out um, how everyone else reacts yes. because that's when the proof's really in the pudding. Like you can think everything's great, but if other people are like, this is still really bad, then you're like, ah, oh, shit, like I should have done this. I should have done this. Um, you know, so we're all, like almost there. Um, 
So that's probably when I'll feel more of the good vibes about it. Yes. But it was still really fun. It was still a super fun experience, good people to work with, and I think we made something really cool. Oh, that's really good to hear. What, um, I guess we would you say it's probably given you a really good appreciation of how hard it is to get a game right? Oh, yeah. Like, I see so much crap online. Like, there's always yeah. negative comments. I mean, the AFL Facebook page in general, there's no, like, they don't ever have a good post. There's yeah. always some cynical prick in the comments section ranting about, oh, like, Carlton should win the spoon or something. I don't know. They're always going off about something. So uh, it didn't surprise me when people started criticizing it last week. But I think it's sort of turned the corner today, which was pretty good. So, um, yeah, it's re- it's really difficult. Things that people think might be an easy fix are generally not. They're yes. generally the harder things to fix. And... Um, yeah, it's a lot of time that just takes to get things right sometimes. Like, if I'll be like, oh, I just want to do this, it doesn't seem like it's too hard. And they're like, oh, well, we actually need graphics, UI, we need this, we need this, we need this. And then you need a database to have all this other information in. And I'm like, yep, okay, that's not happening. So um, you have to take the little wins. And um, I've definitely snuck multiple things into the game without asking because I was like, if I ask for it, it's not going to happen. So I'm just going to tell someone to do it. And if they do it, fantastic. So. <laughs> oh, that's cool, mate. I, um, I always laugh looking at sort of, you know, I'm sure you've read plenty of them, like AFL game wish lists and how ridiculous they get in terms of like, even some... I read the FIFA ones as well, but some people are just like, I want to be in umpire mode. And it's like, how many times, realistically, are you going to play be in umpire mode? <laughs> like, people don't have... I, I even saw a comment, something like, um, on one of my vids recently, because I made a reaction to the trailer vid, and someone put, I'll, I'll only buy it when it's when it's as good as EA or 2K. And it's like, well, you probably got to lower your expectations a little. How big actually is the team working on this game? Because I think I read a comparison, I think when it was Big Ant, they said they had a team of about 45 people. And then you compare that to EA who had like like over a thousand. I don't know if that's completely accurate, but you can imagine the there's a huge gap. Is it a fairly intimate sort of team working on the game? Well, yeah, like EA have a... Um... I think they have like a whole floor just dedicated to audio. So wow. I just put everything into perspective. Um, yeah, I think that probably makes sense. Like somewhere around the f- like 40 to 60 people mark. Yeah. Um, because obviously not everyone in the office is working on the same thing. Like everyone's got different projects. So sure. um, there's probably always constantly like 15 to 20 people working on it at any given time. Because everyone's got their own role. Not everyone is a programmer. You know, there's artists, there's like testing people, QA, um, and then people like me who are just, you know, I don't really have a role. I just do everything that needs to be done. So, um, yeah, like it is a pretty, pretty tight group. And then, yeah, so you get to know what people are sort of doing. Yeah, that's cool. Are you fairly? I, I think you said you you feel like you've produced something pretty cool with AFL Evolution too. In general, are you pretty optimistic about the way the AFL gaming sort of movement is trending? Because there was a time where, um, obviously, after AFL 07 or whatever it was, then we didn't get a lot until AFL Live with Big Ant. And personally, I felt that was my favourite, uh, the Big Ant one. Um, and I thought, gee, if we get them going on a few different releases and sort of build up a bit of a budget and we don't have to start from scratch every time, um, we could actually build something cool. Wicked Witch now has uh, a second rendition. Are you fairly optimistic about where we're heading? Oh, hell yeah. Like, the, the problem a lot of people don't understand is how long it actually takes to change engines. Um, yes. because so even though Wicked Witch had like, this is like their fourth game or something, every single one of them has had to change engine, like the, had the Wii one, then it changed engines for the live two, then it changed engines for Evo. And then Evo changed engines again to unreal for, um, Evo two. A uh, big misconception is a lot of people think unreal was changed halfway through development. No, it was always going to be in unreal. It was always developed in unreal. Uh, the problem was. Because there were so many unknowns about Unreal, it did take a lot longer to get it across to the new engine than previously thought. Um, So now my biggest thing is the next game, they don't have to change engines. They can focus 100% 
on improving everything else in the game. Like this one, obviously, we did a bunch of improvements while we were moving it across. But if more than half of the time spent is changing engines, that's like half that is untapped creativity slash energy that's going to be used to make a better game. So if this one's like, you know, 300% better than the last one, the next one's like a thousand percent better. You know what I mean? So there's a lot more that can be done now that we're at this point. So I'm really happy with um, where it's all going. That's very true. That's good to hear and very reassuring. As people, um, especially because it's like a younger demographic, are probably going to be buying this game. But like there's unrealistic rec- uh, expectations around like, oh, I want a fully in-depth, unlimited season career mode from, from game one. And obviously in the first rendition of the game, or first edition of the game rather, you're not going to get that. But if you get a third or fourth or fifth game, you, you can get um, you know a pretty, pretty good result. Um, I also want to ask you, I watched your trailer breakdown and you talked about that Marley and Pickett spin. Um, and I noticed that, uh, or you mentioned it in the video rather, you got him to spin around, uh, Nick Haynes and in the background, you can see the score is at the right time. Um, tell us about how hard that was to actually do. Ooh, I mean, it wasn't hard to do. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't hard to do. Uh, that might be giving away something. Um, well, basically, <laughs> kind of in the in the game day mode, we sort of spoke about it anyway. Um, like you can now set a custom score line to start your match. Ah, oh, cool. Um, so you, and a custom start time. But for me, it was like in the past, I've kind of had to do that stuff myself and really be like, oh, I'm playing the match to this point, and then getting that moment. Um, yes. But yeah, it's just like attention to detail like that that not everyone will pick up on. So sometimes I do point them out to people because I'm like, look at this cool thing I did and appreciate that it was cool. Um, yeah. But I don't know. I feel like if you do things like that, it really shows people that you actually care than just like same with the fact that the Liam Ryan, like Mark of the Year was in there. Um, yep. Because otherwise they're just like, oh, it's just, you know, someone making a trailer for a game. But there are people that genuinely care about footy there. I think that's something that people spread a lot is that there's not. So um, yeah. I'm always pushing to do all of the cool things that people will understand and get because it just shows you give a damn. That's cool, mate. Did you did you do the Dom Sheed goal? Because I remember they did a recreation preview snippet of Sheed kicking a goal from the boundary. Was that you as well? That was me as well. That was a lot more work uh, to do that. Oh, one. yeah. Because <laughs> I had to work out. There was, there was so many other things I had to work out at the time. I don't think the feature was in it that far. Well, maybe it was. But I needed to. I wanted to get the time right on the scoreboard. That was the biggest challenge wow. for that one, was getting yes. the time right. So I had to get someone to hack in something where it started at, at like the 27-minute mark. And then I was like, all right, I've got like 30 seconds to get the ball down there and like get a set shot from that position. And then sometimes the wind would be terrible. I reckon I took that kick like 100 times. And then the first time I got it, then I don't know, there was something else wrong with it. And then I got it like the second time straight away. And I was like, why did it take me 100 times <laughs> to get it like six times in a row? So, or if I would stuff up the set shot, which was also another thing. Um, but yeah, like again, just trying to get attention to detail, like the scoreboard, obviously if it was like zero to zero, people were like, well, this is dumb. So yeah, sure. sure. Um, oh, nice one. I don't know whether anyone else would have put that much effort in at the studio but i was like i'm happy to do it because i want to see the cool things off it was cool i think a lot of people got around it um there's a cool picture on your instagram i found of um you and shane mumford and mumford's towering over you was that did you meet him through the the uh, working on the game how did that happen okay so um this is this is why i hated the fact that the game got delayed last year um so initially while working on the game, they're like, all right, the game's going to come out round, let's say round five or whatever. I'm like, great, round five, game's coming out. Um, I previously did like a career mode on the AFL game. Um, it's like Brisbane or whatever. So I just had like my press conferences and stuff. And I was like, all right, like how do I make this better for the next game? So I was like, all right, the only way to do that is to get a club involved. So um, I messaged uh, one of the digital guys at GWS. And I was like, hey, I got this idea. What do you think? He's like, dude, that sounds awesome. It took like six months to set up. And then eventually they're like, all right, come in on these couple of days. We'll like film for a couple of days and you can just get like as much footage as you can for your career mode. Um, and I think the only thing I'd actually log- locked in when I was there on the first day was 
doing like a podcast with Dylan Buckley as his coach. Um, <laughs> so we were doing like a fake episode of Dylan Friends and it was him just asking to play and I was like, no, um, <laughs> the whole time. And then the guy was like, what else do you think would be funny? And I was like, I was like, well, I'm kind of short. Do you think if I just like went to the biggest dude, that would be really funny? So I'm just staring up into him. Um, Cause I was pretending to be the coach in these videos, which is why it was so funny. Um, <laughs> so that was, that was a seriously intimidating moment. Um, when Shane Muffer was right there, like as soon as I stared up into him, I'm like, Oh my God, he's going to kill me. And um, I will probably release the video on like a stream or something. Cause I can't use it all now. Cause it's all outdated and whatever. And now that Corona's happened, we're not doing a proper one right. for 2020. Um, so yeah, I was like, uh, I was like, can I poke you in the video? And he's like, he's like, and then the other guy's like, Oh mommy, how do you feel about being poked? And he's like, no, I don't know. And then I just did it anyway. And he's like, but if you do it, like I can come back at you with something. So I was like, I was like, I need you to play a good game. And I like poked him in the stomach. And then he's like, and he's like, do that again. And I'll snap you in half. And I was like, oh my God, that's so good. Like the, oh, the comedic timing on it was fantastic. But um, I'm so spewing that that stuff never came out. But um, yeah, so it was basically just through my own YouTube channel rather than the game was um, doing that stuff. And I think that that's something hopefully that's going to be happening more um, between, you know, AFL creators, especially over this period of time, whether it's just like over Skype or something, um, yep. because there's no footy going on. So we'll wait and see what happens. Yeah, that's very true. Um, have you met many players throughout this experience? Yeah, on the game, I did a lot. Um, I went to I went to pretty much every photo shoot for the Victorian clubs. I didn't oh, do wow. the Bulldogs or no, I did Melbourne or well, we did Melbourne twice. Cause our thing was broken the first time. Um, so yeah, I met a lot of, and I flew to Adelaide to do the two Adelaide teams as well. So they'd wow. be sitting in their chair, like here as if I'm sitting and I'd be, I don't know, here, like being like, all right, now just do this, look forward. And then I'd have like 40 seconds in between shots for the cameras to all reload. So I'd, you know, get my little two cents in there. Um, and it was at the start of 2018 too, which was really good because when I went to Richmond, like they were doing their photo day, everyone was super upbeat because they just won the premiership. So everyone was super happy. And I was like, oh, this is the best. Like I'm here with my favorite team and they're doing so well. And um, I'd get, you know, just get some sneaky questions in there and be like, oh, you know, you're pretty like Dustin Martin didn't say a word to him. Oh, he's, yeah. I was like, he wouldn't say anything anyway, but I was like, mm, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. That sounds like a pretty cool experience. It's a pretty neat segue actually, because I do want to talk to you about your beloved Richmond. Um, first of all, where does that love come from? Why Richmond? Is it a family thing? It's a family thing. Um, on my mum's side anyway, dad goes for Collingwood, but doesn't really oh, wow. like it too much. Um, so like everyone in mum's side goes for, Goes for Richmond. Um, her brother, very, very strong Richmond, I think had the biggest uh, influence of choosing that for me. I think he would have been the uh, the uncle who gets, you know, the Richmond bib or whatever as you, as a child. And mum always took us to games, like when I was like, you know, four or five years old. So, um, and I just loved being at the footy. I loved singing the song, which we definitely didn't do a heap because Richmond was so bad for so long. Um but yeah, just a family thing for the Tigers. Yeah, nice one. That's cool. I'd ask Caden this question, but it's kind of similar for you because as a Richmond fan, you would have experienced pretty much both ends of the spectrum and everything in between. You've, yeah. you've seen it all. Um, what was it like, first of all, as a younger man supporting Richmond in that pre-Hardwick era? And like I'm talking like the Terry Wallace and Danny Frawley era. If, um, if, I don't think that's too old for you. Um, what was that like? Uh, did you lose interest at all? Or were you sort of like Caden? Caden was saying he could never turn off the TV, even though he, uh, Melbourne's like down by 100 points. Are you the sort of same fan? What, what was it like going through that? Um, yeah, it was kind of hard, I think, because Richmond didn't have a lot of TV games because they weren't very good. Um, and we yeah. didn't have Foxtel, so oh, like I'd be listening to the radio most weeks. Um, so I'd still be yeah. like paying attention. Um 
and yeah the radio was great like because we didn't go to like a heap of games every year like we might go to like one like we'd go to like the opening round and then maybe like one, one more probably north melbourne and that's why i hate north melbourne because they always beat us like just um <laughs> and so like the radio is my greatest ally in the war of the tigers versus the world so i'd always be able to listen in to all the games that were happening I, like i'd just sort of you know lock myself in my room and just listen to the game i'd have my you know little plush footy and just kick it around the room um and then i think there was like a period of time where i didn't really know what was going on it might have been like 2010 or 11 i don't know because there's just a lot of ha things happening um i don't know why i didn't know what was happening but i just remember one year i went to a like a nab game like a, a nab cup game it was when they had that weird like two halves uh, like you'd play two people on the one night so there'd be like three teams going on and i was yes. like i don't know any of these players like I was, I was like, why don't I know any of these players? Probably too too many times listening to the games on the radio, so I couldn't actually see who any of our bloody players were. Um, but yeah, Richo was the best. That's all I can say. <laughs> I love that. Um, wow, yeah. So because like like the D's, like you said, the Tigers really struggled there for a little while, and then in enter Damien Hardwick, probably one of the best coaches in the league uh, in terms of his, probably second behind Clarko in terms of, you know, what he's been able to achieve. T taking Richmond, I remember 2010, I know you said you, you weren't watching as much around then, but that was when Hardwick came in. And that was the year the Eagles uh, won the Spurn, so I'm a big Eagles fan. Yeah. And um, that was when Hardwick took them from, that was supposed to be the worst team in history that year, almost like Gold Coast. And then suddenly in the second half of the season, I remember Hardwick just took them to being a really good club. Uh, sorry, uh, they, they smashed West Coast. like 0-9 or something that year. Correct. Right? Yeah, you're right, 100%. And they, then you belted us by about, I think Jack Rewalt kicked 10 goals. And since then, Hardwick has just absolutely turned that club around, which is ridiculous. What was it like in 2017 going into that grand final? What were your feelings like? Was there a sense of like, I can't believe this is happening? Because 2016 was a really rough year for Richmond as well. I think you missed the, you missed the finals by some way. Um, what was it like for you when you finally got that opportunity? Well, yeah, the three finals prior, like 13, 14, 15, like 13 against Carlton sucked because I hated Carlton. Uh, 14, I drove to Adelaide and that sucked because it was over early. And then wow. 15, I hate North Melbourne. And I was like, surely we don't lose to North Melbourne. And we lost it. And I don't know, like everything, something weird just happened in like all of these games. Like the, the, the Carlton game, like Nick Diagon kicked four goals. Like who would have thought Nick yeah. Diagon would kick four goals in a final? Anyway, um, and then yeah, like 2016, I I think I went to like 15 games in 2016. I went to a lot of football that year, and I was like, we're not that bad. I was like, we're losing games, but we're not that bad. And so I always had confidence they were gonna, you know, come back in 2017. I didn't think we'd win the whole thing. Um, but yeah, grand final day, I remember catching the train in super early, met my friends at the pub, and I was, I was like, we have not thought about losing this game because we're so confident we're going to win. That was my only wow. mindset going into that. I was like, I, I cannot picture a way we don't win this game. Just like from the, pre the prelim and the first final were more like shockers. And then grand final day, it was probably the, it was probably the quietest I'd ever been at a game. Like, I'm normally really loud, really vocal. And in, like, the third quarter, I think when Kane Lambert kicked the goal to put us, like, I don't know, 20 points up, that was in my head. I was like, we've, we've won the game. And I just did not say a word until, like, 20 minutes into the last quarter when someone else kicked the goal and put us, like, 46 points up. And I was like, yes! Like, I just let it all out. Um, so it was just, like, super awesome. Wow, yeah. I can relate. I, um... I was lucky enough to be there in 06 when the Eagles won the grand final, but I was 12. But um, for me, it felt like a lifetime until 2018. I was lucky enough to be there as then as well. Um, and I can just remember that overwhelming emotion. For me, I don't, I've often wondered if the Eagles get back there this year. I, oh, sorry. Let's say maybe next year. It depends what happens with footy this year. But hypothetically, say we get there with Tim Kelly and we, you know, we win by uh, 89 points how that would actually feel how i'd contrast that between 2018 whether it would be as special 
How would you contrast the feelings of 2017 and 2019? Was it quite the same or was it just as sweet? Oh, uh, 2019 was different because we obviously started the season really poorly. So like there was 2017, we were five and zip. So it was like we were good early days. Um, True. But for me, footy in 2019 was like, I didn't feel like after a win, like during the regular season, I was like four points, let's go. Like no real celebrating each win until round 22 when we played the West Coast. You guys, like that was the first game. I was like, all right, this is on, like it's on. Like this is the proof in the pudding. We won that game. I was so happy. Like, I was overjoyed. And then I was like, all right, like that was the first, the first final. Then we beat Brisbane the next week. Then we beat Brisbane two weeks later. I flew to the Gabba. That was awesome. Um, and then the prelim was, was probably the grand final, like that I, in my head anyway, of um, how I experienced it was the prelim final where we were, we were gone. Like, we were gone in that game. I don't know how we won that game. We were so bad in the first half. And then the second half, like, when we just – we came out of the blocks and I was like, oh, my God, like, it's happening. We're actually not choking this prelim like we did the year before. And <laughs> when we won that game, I I couldn't see a way. Um, or when GWS beat Collingwood the next day, I could not see, have seen a way we lost that grand final. So I I didn't – feel as like amazing at the grand final. The other part of the grand final not being as special was because I was doing that AFL video. So I, I wasn't with, you know, like I go with my mum every week. So I wasn't with my mum. Um, and, you know, we're in the corporate. So not everyone's super excited about what's happening, especially if it's not a close game, they're kind of zoned out a little bit. So um, that was sort of my vibe, but that prelim final was so good. That was my like grand final moment. Yeah. Oh, it sucked. It's co- like Collingwood. Okay. Collingwood. True. True. Um, the, the, I remember the pregame for that match very, very prominently. It's probably the, the best pregame I've ever been to, which is why I really wanted Collingwood to actually win the prelim last year because I was like, that's going to be the most epic grand final ever. Richmond Collingwood, um, because I remember the pregame for that was it was like a war, like you you're in the MCG, you know Collingwood's trying to get their Collingwood chant going around the ground. Richmond are like slamming their thing in reply. It was and this is ten minutes before the players have even come out. Like the wow. the football had not even started. It was so intense. Like it was the most intense vibe I've ever felt at the G. And I was like, someone's gonna get knocked out before the siren even starts. Like it was so intense. Um, and then, yeah, like, I was – I, like, didn't really hate it too much because the game was over so early. Like, I could I could deal with that in the second half. Like, I was – by the end of the game, I'm like, well, you know, we, we fluffed it in the first half, so our second half was shit. And um, I knew, like, we had our, you know, players were injured and whatever, like, excuses. But, um, yeah, it made 2019 much better. The fact that we actually got there. And yeah, the one week at a time was because I was like, well, it doesn't matter. It's just it's just a game. It's just a game. It's not a final. It's not the end. It's very true. It's ironic that the year you didn't win the flag was when you finished top with two wins clear at 18 and four, and then you won the flag twice from third. So that just goes to show yeah. it's, it's about what time of the year you turn up. That's it. Well, you're clearly a very passionate Richmond fan. I'm a very passionate Eagles fan. And I asked this question of Caden, who's a massive D's fan, obviously. In light of coronavirus, okay, this is a hypothetical. Let's say, hypothetically, Richmond go under. Um, th- for, for whatever reason, they've got 100,000 <laughs> yeah. members, but let's just say <laughs> they're the <laughs> only team, Gold Coast survive, and Richmond go under. Could you follow another team? What's what's your passion? Is it is it more for the game, or is it Richmond, or do you think you'd actually lose interest in the sport in general? I'd still enjoy the sport, um, but I wouldn't follow a team. I, yeah. I I enjoy the sport, but 
I just wouldn't follow a team. I'd just be enjoying each game as it is. Like, I like barracking for different teams, depending on the game scenario. Like, if a team's a few goals down, I'm like, oh, it'd be really cool if this team won. Like, I'd be, like, excited when they kick a goal. So I'm like, oh, like, that'd be good. So I do enjoy Like, I still really enjoy the sport. I think it's obviously a great sport. Um, but I just wouldn't care as much <laughs> as about yeah. any other team. Yeah, that's it, mate. I, I'm with you on that one. One final question before we wrap up this podcast, which has been a lot of fun, mate. Um, why don't you tell us what's on the horizon for you? Like you said, you're very busy at the moment with uh, this COVID stuff. Um, but what can people expect from your channel over the next coming months? Oh, um, oh, do I give an exclusive? That's a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, there's obviously this AFL game's coming out. Um, when's this podcast supposed to come out? Uh, I haven't decided yet. I'm thinking later this week. Okay, so um, obviously I'm not coaching GWS this time around because Corona, Um, but I figured because my Brisbane career finished in 2019, what a great place to pick up in 2020. So I'm going uh, back to Brisbane, doing a Brisbane Lions career mode. I bought my media polo. It's in the the cupboard back there and um, should be a bit of fun continuing an ongoing storyline like that and then just... A lot of cricket stuff. Fingers crossed there's a World Cup later in the year. We don't know. Um, and then really just enjoying my streams a bit more. Like really building on the community I've built over there and doing more variety of stuff. Like I'm super keen on Final Fantasy VII to come out. Like I don't really know if you guys know anything about that, but that's a really cool game that's coming out. <laughs> um, and just, yeah, sort of just doing doing different things and enjoying them is my main goal this year yeah awesome mate glad to hear it well thank you so much for coming on the true footy podcast for those listening or watching on youtube i'm going to leave uh the links to all twisty's sort of social media and his channel everything in the description so um yeah thanks again uh dean and uh i'll see you sometime in the future (laughs) no worries thanks jesse